Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Sanjoy Bhattacharya. Uh, I am the head of the WHO Collaborating Center for Global Health Histories, and which is how I know Claudia uh, and Neil as well, um, and, and have uh, been at the old building of the WHO European Regional Office before, and I'm amazed and impressed with this new wonderful facility that you now have. So, um, I mean, I mean, I should point out that the coffee, the tea, and the cake in the back is the healthiest fare possible uh, from Copenhagen shops, so you should eat without guilt, and you're encouraged to do so. Uh, the seminar is being live streamed, so um, I hope many other people are joining us online as well. At the end of the seminar, questions can be asked via Twitter, and my dear colleague, Niels, who knows all about computers, unlike me, is in charge of, uh, of highlighting some, some of the most interesting questions that come up uh, uh, through Twitter. Uh, our Twitter hashtag is hashtag GHH Capital Histories. You can also email us or your questions at ghhhistories at euro.who.int. And uh, our colleagues in the Wellcome Trust, uh, WHOHQ, uh, colleagues here and my WHO Collaborating Center York are tweeting and Facebooking the event as it happens. Um, the WHO GHH seminar uh, 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 series is possibly one of the longest running public events that we've co-organized with the WHO headquarters and regional offices for over 10 years. And that would not have been possible uh, uh, without support from the Wellcome Trust, which uh, uh, in 2007 uh, took a decision to give us a pilot grant to try and expand the global focus uh, of these events and, 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 uh, uh, and, and, and make the whole program more ambitious in, and, and international in its composition. So I'm absolutely delighted that we're having uh, 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 another such seminar in Copenhagen, which represents new collaborations with the European Regional Office. And we have a wonderful lineup uh, of four speakers today, uh, a historian, a geographer, who is also an expert in medical humanities, Claudia, who you know well, and Dr. Adris, who I've met for the first time. So uh, the way we're going to divide up the talks is we're going to give the academic speakers 20 minutes each. Uh, I'd like to put my hand up and say this was not my decision. Uh, this is the hospitality, the result of the hospitality of the WHO regional office, followed by our colleagues from WHO who will speak for 10 minutes each. So Mark, can I invite you to start the proceedings? Thank you so much. How have I put the next one up, Niels? Thank you very much, Sanjoy, and, and thank you very much uh, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, and to talk about some of the things that have interested me uh, as a historian of medicine. And I'm going to talk about well-being or give you some historical reflections on well-being through the lens of the history of stress uh, in particular. I think we would be crazy to assume that our current preoccupations with health and well-being are new. If you go back historically, you can look at ancient Greek cultures, ancient Chinese medicine, through the medieval and early modern period to recognize that doctors and their patients were concerned about how you promote health and well-being, even if they didn't use those terms necessarily, and how you prevent illness or restore health from illness. Quite often, those were expressed in terms of balance, balancing the humors, balanced lifestyles, moderate lifestyles, balancing work and life. But there's been a long tradition, a long history of interest in how we promote health and well-being. I'm not going to talk about that longer history. I'm going to focus on the 20th century, drawing on some of my own research, but in a way that I hope will link in to some uh, recent debates and some of our recent political uh, interest in health and well-being. And I'm going to do it uh, just by talking through this slide, 
um, what I called rather grandly a matrix of stress and well-being. And I want to make two, uh, two caveats at the start. The first is that I'm using terms stress and well-being fairly loosely. If you want to ask me or challenge me about the meanings of those. Niels, we've lost this one. Does that matter or is that just? Okay. Um, if you want to, you know, if we need to talk about the definitions of those terms, then we can, but I'm using them fairly vaguely. The second point I want to make, the second caveat, is that I don't mean this matrix to be static and categorical. Rather, I hope that what will come out of my talk is that we should see these relationships and these categories as relational and dynamic. The horizontal axis, if I start talking through the slide before I give some historical examples, the, historical axis, the, uh, the horizontal axis refers to the ways in which historically we have measured and managed stress and well-being. So at the individual level, we have tended to focus on physiological and psychological indicators of well-being, measuring hormone levels or using psychological tests that are partly about self-reporting, uh, self partly uh, about uh, objective observation. Um, so the measurement has focused on how we identify stressed individuals, for example, psychologically and physiologically. And in the management level, there have also been various attempts through the 20th century to identify individual strategies to provide resources or policies that encourage individuals to become more resilient and be able to cope with stress. At the same time, there has been a push, I think, through the 20th century to shift responsibility onto individuals for their own well-being, um, and in some ways, therefore, to blame them if they're stressed and not coping. So the left end of that historical axis refers to the ways in which we formalize, measure, and manage well-being at an individual level. On the right-hand end, um, during the course of the 20th century, there, were, there have been a variety of efforts to measure well-being at a population level. Um, and in terms of measurement, I suppose there have been a variety of qualitative and quantitative indicators, some of which might be related to the economy, GDP, for example, some of which might be about mortality or morbidity trends. And again, an attempt to capture shifts in levels of happiness or well-being across time and also across space to compare uh, national differences in terms of happiness, uh, levels of stress and well-being. At a management level on that historical axis at the right-hand end in the population level, of course, there have been a variety of attempts to address some of the, of the challenges presented by the evidence about mortality and morbidity trends, for example, by increasing certain types of policies, in introducing certain types of policies, or investing resources at a population level to improve uh, health and well-being. If we turn to the vertical axis, and again, I don't want to suggest that these are independent necessarily in the way in which uh, they're represented here, and some of the complexity I hope will come out in a moment. The vertical axis refers to the ways in which we understand the causes of stress and well-being. At the bottom, I've put constitution, and this is one of the ways in which people have identified the inherited, the genetic, the constitutional, the temperamental factors that allow us to cope with stress and remain well, or allow us to adapt to change. So it's, it's, it's conceived not entirely in genetic terms, but largely in that frame. This is about the individual constitution that allows us to cope in certain ways. At the top end of the axis, I put stressful life events. And in this literature through the 20th century, much of the focus was not on the individual, but on the environmental circumstances, the conditions of living, the experiences that we have individually and collectively, um, that can make us stressed and undermine our health and sense of well-being. And in the stress literature through the 20th century, this has focused on a number of factors. It might be housing, it might be work, it might be family, it might be the broader economy that people have looked at to try and identify what it is that has caused stress at individual and population levels and how we then uh, might manage it. So the model that I'm presenting here, individual to population, the horizontal axis, measurement and management, and the vertical axis uh, from constitution to stressful life events in terms of how we understand the causes. Now, I want to refine this, of course, and explain how it 
operates through time, this is two-dimensional, but I want to demonstrate that the relationship between these categories and these axes and the point we are at any moment in time is deeply contingent upon a set of uh, historical, social, cultural factors. And I'm going to do that by discussing, taking snapshots, if you like, of the 1920s and the 1970s. And I want just to say something about the ways in which these played out in those moments in time. Now, in the early 1920s, uh, many Western countries were struggling to cope with, recover from the First World War. During and after the First World War, uh, nations, families, communities had to cope with many deaths and many injured and disabled servicemen and women. And of course, those injuries were not just uh, physical, which itself created certain stresses, but also psychological as well. And one of the, the big debates, of course, during and after the First World War is how we understand and manage uh, soldiers with shell shock, for example. In the 1920s, if one takes the vertical axis between constitution and stressful life events, although many stress researchers understood that war was stressful, most of the emphasis in the discussion was on constitution. What are the constitutional factors that predispose a soldier to breaking down? What, it is, what is it about somebody's temperament or character that makes them weaker? or flawed in some kind of way. And, and most of the literature, for example, in the 1920s was very much directed at the constitutional factors that undermined health and well-being and made people stressed. As I said, I, I don't want to suggest that stre the stress of war was not part of those debates, but the overwhelming interest in that period was in the constitutional factors. If one looks at the horizontal axis between individual and population, Again, it, it wouldn't be fair to say that nobody was interested in individuals or the impact of shell shock on individuals and their families. But again, the dominant interest in most countries was on the impact of constitutional weakness, a susceptibility to stress, on the population, on the military efficiency of armies, on the economic productivity uh, of nations. It was, it was brought into a debate for example, about how you paid pensions to disabled servicemen. Did you pay for the physical injuries? Did you pay compensation and pensions to those who were psychologically disabled? That became a key political and economic issue in the 1920s. And it meant quite often that uh, people with psychological injuries and shell shock, their individual concerns were dismissed because of the interests of the state in approaching and coping with the economic burden. So if one had to place debates and approaches in the 1920s, it would be at the population end uh, of that spectrum between individual uh, and population. So in the 1920s, my argument would be, and again, I, I don't want to push this too far. This is a schematic, uh, rather vague approach. But if I were to say, if I wanted to capture uh, approaches and understandings of stress and well-being in the 1920s in relation particularly to the post-war reconstruction and shell shock, I would say that it's in the bottom right-hand corner, somewhere, a quadrant, somewhere in that area dominates the debate about stress and well-being. If we move forward, uh, and again, this is schematic to the 1970s, we see a slightly different picture. Again, in the post-war period, Years and decades after the First World War, people were concerned about the impact during and after the war of combat stress, of flying stress, and what became, of course, after Korea and Vietnam, post-traumatic stress disorder. So there were similar concerns in some ways about the impact of stress or stressful circumstances on levels of health and well-being in relation to those circumstances. If we look at stress research in that post-Second World War period, it presents a striking contrast to the 1920s. People had not dismissed the idea that constitution was important, but much of the research in that period focused on identifying stressful life events, uh, the work, life, family circumstances that undermined health, that stressed people uh, and made them ill. And there are two particular examples of this. One is the work of Holmes and Ray, um, on stressful life events and the social readjustment rating scale, the attempt to identify stressful life events and measure the impact that they had on health and well-being and how they could be used as indicators of incipient illness. And the kind of events they looked at were 
bereavement, marriage, divorce, loss of a job, economic circumstances, illness in the family, and so forth. And they rated these according to uh, people's perception of how significant they were in their lives, and then used those as an indicator of how likely it would be that somebody would get ill uh, as a result. So the stressful life events literature became really crucial to the understanding of stress in that post-Second World War period. The second example of that focus on environment is a slightly more political one, perhaps, and it came out of social scientists such as uh, Bruce and Barbara Dorenwent in the States, who explored the terrain of stressful life events, but made the point, some of the stressful life events literature is not particularly sensitive to culture, to gender, to age differences and so forth. What Dorenwent and Dorenwent identified was the rather dramatic inequalities across social class in particular in terms of the stressful life events that people experienced. And their point was that most of the stress of living was visited on the lower social classes. And they became part of a movement for social reform, arguing for social reform for addressing social inequalities in, in wealth and health in order to restore or improve uh, health and well-being. So, in the 1970s, my point is that if you look at that vertical axis, most of the research at this time was focusing more on stressful life events, on the, on the environmental, the social, the cultural determinants of health and well-being than it was on constitution at this point. If we look at the horizontal axis, and, and I'll come back to say something very um, uh, briefly about this at the end. If we look at the horizontal axis, most of the research was now on individuals. Not at the net, it's not entirely true because there was some very strong work in Sweden, for example, into uh, social determinants, particularly uh, work, family determinants of health. But a lot of the Western literature in particular was interested in individuals, in what kind of resources we can give individuals or what kind of resources can they pay for, largely, increasingly, and um, what kind of responsibility should the individual be taking for their health and well-being? Now, you can trace this to a particular political perspective. There are a number of ways in which you can um, explain this. One of the ways in which you can explain the focus towards uh, individualizing health and well-being is the rise of psychology, which highlighted the individual nature, the perceptual nature. Uh, it's not so much about the life circumstances, it's about how you perceive them, how you interpret them, and then how you develop coping strategies as a result. And that was seen as, within psychology, as largely an individual phenomenon. So the rise of psychology in some ways shifts attention in the stress research towards the individual. But the other is a political and economic one. If you think of the 70s and through the 80s, many Western countries were moving towards the right. You see it very clearly, of course, in Britain with the Thatcherite policies. We're looking to draw back state responsibility for health and well-being and pushing responsibility onto the individual as an economic decision, as a way of reducing state spending and encouraging individual responsibility. So if we were to think about where we would place, where I would place, research in the 1970s, I would say that if you look at the range of literature around that time from physiologists, psychologists, social scientists, then you would say that most of the focus in the 70s is in the upper left quadrant, focusing on stressful life events uh, and individualizing strategies for recovery. There's two things I want just to say as a conclusion. The first is that there is, I think, running through the history of stress in the 20th century, a number of paradoxes. The first is, if you look at the 1920s, it's interesting that the focus on constitutional causes leads to an approach that focuses on populations, not a focus that, uh, not a, uh, an approach that focuses on individuals. Now, in some ways, that might seem counterintuitive, that you would expect uh, a research focus on social circumstances to be associated with population, not the constitutional approach. But the constitutional approach is linked very closely to the concerns about population levels, largely because of a, uh, a, a concern about protecting the economic and productive potential of countries. If you look at the 1970s, the opposite occurs. I was, perhaps one might assume that focus on stressful life events would lead to population level policies to address those social inequalities, in fact, what it's associated with. I'm not saying it's driving it. I'm not sure about the causative relation. But what it becomes associated with is an individualized approach that shifts responsibility away from states addressing 
the social economic determinants and the social inequalities of health towards the individual as the person responsible for their own health and well-being. So there are paradoxes in those relationships that perhaps as historians uh, we have not unpicked fully, but they don't necessarily uh, appear intuitive. They appear sometimes counterintuitive. So, and this goes back to my point at the beginning that this is not static fixed categories. This are rather, these are rather fluid relationships between approaches and, and not at any point fixed, but also uh, dynamic uh, and in contention. The second concluding point I want to make, and it comes back to some of our discussions this morning um, with Claudia and others, is that these debates, these approaches, these understandings, these understandings of causes, these approaches to measurement and management are deeply political. They are deeply determined by the political, the economic, the social and cultural context. It's not just that those contexts are driving patterns of health and well-being and stress, but they are also directly informing the models that we use, the matrix within which we understand it, and the strategies that we implement to manage them. Thank you. Um, can I invite Professor Sarah Atkinson, Professor of Geography and Medical Humanities from Durham University in the United Kingdom. Thank you, Sanjoy, and thanks, Niels and Claudia, for the invitation. I have to follow Mark, which is uh, no mean feat. Um, my presentation is slightly different to Mark's in that I'm looking at the concept of well-being itself, well-being, happiness, satisfaction with life. I'm going to sort of put them all together because they, they're all trying to get at the same, something that's um, the same sort of concept. The more positive aspects uh, that we try to capture through well-being. Unlike Mark, I'm, I'm not so eloquent, so I'm going to read my presentation partly so I stick to time as well. Oh, first I get my presentation up. No? Okay. So one of the things that um, people, <laughs> one of the claims that's made about well-being is that we lack conceptual clarity around what well-being really is. And I'd like to argue that although this is the case in the detail, we do nonetheless have a dominant usage which has several characteristics that frame, direct and constrain the sort of actions and interventions that we consider as possible options to enhance well-being. So most approaches to well-being, whether we're talking about objective or subjective well-being, locate well-being with the individual as something that's an attribute or inheres to the individual. And as Marx indicated, this is important to pause and reflect on because this has not always been the case. Uh, again, if we look back to the 60s and 70s, well-being as a term was the collective descriptor, particularly in relation to the economy, the economy at the nation, national level. Secondly, most approaches handle the very abstract and complex nature of well-being by breaking it down into reducible parts in what's been called the components approach. We have various lists of components, objectively and or subjectively assessed. Here's a couple of examples using both objective and subjective indicators. They may constitute well-being itself, or they may um, position some of these components as influencing some aspects of well-being. We also have participatory consultations of what communities themselves consider their priorities for well-being. And these, this is a, consult <coughs> a consultation that took place in my own country, in the United Kingdom. The specific category of subjective well-being, which has gained a lot of interest in recent years, is captured through either an economic utilitarian approach associated with happiness, and in particular Richard Layard, or a psychological approach associated with meaning, purpose, and self-worth, and associated with people like Carol Riff and her colleagues. This distinction is not only disciplinary, but also philosophical. We talk about hedonic compared with eudaimonic well-being. But how these elements of hedonic and eudaimonic well-being relate to one another may be in tension, and which forms of well-being is privileged also varies by both setting and scale. We might, for example, expect eudaimonic well-being goals of purpose and meaning in life ultimately to trump conflicting hedonic goals. But the hedonic well-being that drive, derives from individualized consumerism has been cast as a threat to sustainable well-being, 
both as individual, societal, or indeed global. So conceptualizing well-being as a set of oh, I don't want that. conceptualizing well-being as a set of entities to be individually acquired does bring advantages for both research and policy. First, it enables us to ascribe stability to well-being, at least in the medium term, which is essential if we're going to measure well-being, from well-being measurements to be meaningful. Secondly, monitoring trends, assessing interventions, and comparing different social units um, can aggregate indicators from individual measures. And thirdly, change can then be related to change in those opportunities and resources which may facilitate the acquisition of the various components. And this is effectively what most people are trying to do. So what I want to do is really look at some, some thoughts, some critiques of that, and some, some alternative approaches, and to throw out the question of what we can do with those. Understanding well-being as primarily individual may risk a tendency to examine determinants of well-being at a similarly individual or local scale. And an important insight from my own discipline of geography is how spatial differences are multi-scalar, connecting international, national and local authority and neighbourhoods, and involving physical and social dimensions of space. If we consider subjective well-being, both area level and national level deprivation or prosperity and resource availability have been shown to influence both individual and local levels of well-being. Studies of change in the peri-urban districts in the new economies of Latin America and Asia have illustrated how global trends for an individualized aspiration and consumption find themselves in tension with traditional values of community cohesion and unity. And the importance of spatial variations and inequalities in well-being across different scales is further illustrated through work on the relationships between income and subjective well-being. Income has attracted a disproportionate uh, attention in research on subjective well-being because of its very, very central role in this argument for attention to uh, subjective well-being. This is the Easterlin paradox, um, which is widely quoted. It, it purports to show that as material, um, material levels have increased, in it is in the US, happiness has not. So um, the question is, what is going on? And Easterlin's formulation has fueled the, the rise in attention to subjective well-being as the endpoint of policy intervention. But interestingly, it also supports income redistribution through progressive taxation, and so, as you might imagine, has been quite seriously challenged as well. Debates around Easterlin highlight, highlight the complexities of scale and place. Cultural factors can affect the extent to which subjective well-being may be expressed, complicating comparison. And we need a greater understanding of with whom and at what scale we are making comparisons. And I think these are questions that are probably very important for an organisation like the World Health Organisation. Which determinants most influence subjective well-being also varies across space and across time, as does whether it is the absolute or the relative value in income and other indicators that is key. That's another area of debate. This kind of evidence highlights the complexities in developing and evaluating policy interventions and exposes a range of issues that need consideration across different scales of governance. In policy-facing research and practice, well-being is located as the outcome, the desirable endpoint of other aspects of daily life and of governance and of policy intervention. But well-being can also be an important process factor for other outcomes, and this happens in several different ways and with different policy implications. First, there's a large amount of funding being invested to identify a tighter definition of the concept of well-being. The argument for this generally follows a line that an ill-defined well-being makes it difficult to evaluate interventions and creates barriers to communication across different sectors, the argument that we need some kind of unified currency, if you like. In a counter-argument, research uh, that we've carried out with local governments in the United Kingdom demonstrated advantages to an ill-defined understanding of well-being that creates a site around which discursive struggles can take place and enables valuable reflection and discussion of what the goals of go local government action really are. Establishing a tight and measurable definition of well-being in order to evaluate outcomes would then seriously limit the scope of the policy work that the concept has the potential to achieve. Secondly, positioning well-being as a process factor challenges 
the common separation of subjective and objective formulations of well-being. Both research and in our popular imagination, we increasingly equate well-being at an individual scale with various terms of positive affect and particularly happiness um, has tended to be the term to capture this, partly because it fits well with the economic approach to flourishing as the utility that people want to maximise in their lives, the driver of our choices and the entity that we want to enhance through policy. But in Wilson and Pickett's uh, spirit level argument, health inequalities are strongly associated with relative inequalities in material and developmental resources, which indicates an important mediating role for something along the lines of happiness with one's circumstances. In this argument, it becomes rather difficult to distinguish which of happiness, wealth and health is the process and which the outcome. And research that only considers the local scale rather than a multi-scalar perspective may gloss over further problematic aspects of how subjective well-being is being expressed. Those with advantages in life may express contentment and happiness without much care for the underpinning global and local relations of inequality, while those in, deprive, those in deprivation may express contentment and happiness from an acceptance of the conditions of social injustices. In either case, the subjective well-being that's being expressed emerges from what we might consider undesirable cognitive and affective states, and thus not only reflects but also feeds a lack of critical thinking about society's values and the alternative possibilities. Thirdly, the approaches of a positive psychology have positioned subjective well-being under internal and individual control. Some of the things Mark's just been talking about. No longer primarily an outcome of external factors, those factors that are the proper concern of local and national and multinational governments, but a process of internal management and the object of personal responsibility. And we can see these sort of titles of books that say how we can make our life great. It's in our own hands. This also positions subjective well-being as influencing various other personal outcomes and socially recognised criteria of success. These outcomes include health conditions and health-related behaviours, employment and earning capacity, and productivity at work. The promise of the power of working on one's own internal well-being logically leads to policy responses that similarly focus primarily on individual deficits in fostering and sustaining well-being. Cognitive behavioural therapy has shown a rapid momentum of uptake across a range of conditions and social contexts, while the Buddhist-inspired practices of mindfulness are also attracting a large amount of policy interest. And if the acquisition of the objective material resources of a flourishing life are largely determined by internal attitudes, then inequality can be dismissed as a result of personal def deficiency and a failure of citizenship. Lynn Friedley has called this focus on personal deficiency a shift from welfare to well-being, which takes concrete uh, form in practices relating to unemployment benefits in my own country, in the UK, which expose a growing governance of personality in which only quite a constrained definition of attitudes and behaviours are considered acceptable. The cultural theorist Sarah Ahmed profoundly problematizes the very notion of happiness within contemporary Western society, arguing that happiness is a highly politically charged concept. The avowed sources of happiness are importantly predefined for us. For example, oops, no, love, marriage and children, wealth, success and social standing, health, fitness and particular style, and as such direct us towards making specific life choices and have considerable political con content in reproducing social norms, consumption norms, and various forms of discrimination. Moreover, if achieving success in all areas of life is apparently only limited by our own positive attitudes and choices, part of presenting oneself as a successful and modern social being necessarily involves enacting or performing an appearance of subjective well-being. Well-being as performance and process, rather than experience or outcome, raises really quite serious questions for what measuring well-being as an outcome for policy purposes can really tell us, and whether it becomes a meaningful thing to do. The movement within the social sciences back towards the interests of the humanities in the emotional, the relational, and the non-representational domains of social life 
has started to inform very different conceptualizations of well-being. Instead of an entity to be acquired or attained by the individual, well-being is an emergent effect of any given space and time. In a relatively early attempt to capture the spatial complexities and relationalities of both objective and subjective well-being, the French geographer Sébastien Fleuret, with myself, proposed what has become known as the spaces of well-being approach. This explores how different social and spatial contexts may be facilitative to well-being and proposes that well-being is emergent through four interrelated spaces of resource mobilization. But how such different resource spaces relate to one another is highly under research beyond preliminary suggestions that sp such spaces are not hierarchical but mutually reinforcing. The last few years have witnessed a rise in research that is engaging with well-being from a range of important and critical directions. Thinking of well-being as effect renders it potentially unstable, always emergent and becoming. But we also accept well-being as relatively stable and meaningfully measured. Deleuze and Guattari's work on assemblage and on striated and smooth space, research on embodied experience and insights from non-representational theory offer possible resources to think about well-being as an emergent effect, but one that is simultaneously stable and unstable, fixed and changeable. How well-being becomes stable, how it becomes destabilized and restabilized, informs how well-being is amenable to change and the practices we need to effect this. Time is implemented in much research on well-being. The variations during a life course, the transitional moments that destabilize well-being, or the trajectories of different nation states. But there's been little attention to the temporalities of well-being in these ways, which is badly needed to redress the more static understandings. And as Mark has already indicated, there's a similar gap about well-being as a potentially collective entity that's something more than just individual, the aggregation of individual levels. And this has had fairly limited traction within policy. The concepts of emergence and becoming in well-being research decenter the individual person as the primary focus and emphasize assemblage, effective flows, and the tensions of habitual and destabilizing embodied experiences. This decentering may afford pathways through which to comprehend well-being as collective beyond the aggregation of individuals. And these approaches have very different implications for policy. Rather than supporting the acquisition of individual well-being skills, the emphasis has to come on the setting, the assemblage, and the nature of time and space. Well. Thank you for that, Sarah. Can I now invite Dr. Claudia Stein, the Director of the Division of Information, Evidence, Research and Innovation at the WHO Regional Office for Europe. Thank you very much. And you can imagine how hard it is for me now to follow those two speakers. But what helps me is it has really flagged how incredibly difficult it is to deal with this issue and to deal with it at an organizational level. But uh, this is a great opportunity to present to you what we've been trying to do over the past two years. And we thank Sanjoy very much for bringing this seminar to us again and the Wellcome Trust for sponsoring it. Um, we hope that this is um, the extension of a very long friendship and love. So let me tell you what we've been trying to do with all this said at the Regional Office for Europe. Um, as Mark was rightly saying, well-being has been with us for thousands of years. And well-being has been with WHO since 1948, constitutionally. But what have we done on this? And why haven't we done more? And I want to explore this a little bit, explain where we are going with this, and hopefully very humbly um, propose to you that we still have a lot of work ahead. Now, I will not go into this. Uh, I think everybody in the room knows what Health 2020 is, and Argus will expand on that. But what is key here, that this is a policy that emphasizes health and well-being. Now, this is not self-evident. This is something that we do. And uh, the European region has been pretty innovative and avant-gardistic in this way. Even Health for All had a well-being target. So with this mandate from our member states, it is clear that we must do something about the measurement of well-being if we really want to seriously 
uh, assess the implementation of this policy. And as I said earlier, it's been with us for a long time. Well-being is at the centre and the core of what we do. Health is defined as the complete physical, mental and social well-being state and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. We have been very clear on that, but despite this very clear statement from 1948, what we've been measuring over the almost last 70 years is neither health nor well-being. We've been reporting on death disease and disability. And we've done this really well. We do this every year. We have a, a, mon a really huge amount of publications globally and regionally, but this is neither health nor well-being. And so we haven't actually been measuring either. But of course, with this mandate again from our member states, we can no longer sit on this. And although we are now jumping on that train fairly late, at least we're jumping on the train and we've recognized we must. And we must because our member states are basically giving us the marching orders. When they adopted the Health 2020 policy framework two years ago, they adopted it with a set of targets. Six targets, some of them pretty classic and traditional, like reduced mortality, increased life expectancy and so forth, and some health system targets. But there are also targets on inequalities and specifically one on well-being. And that is to enhance the well-being of the European population. It is not a quantified target. Given what you've just heard from the previous two speakers, that would be quite a challenge, but it is there. And that means if we have a target, we must measure. And measure we do. And of course, when the debate about indicators arose, we were thinking of a huge amount of indicators we could potentially use, but of course, they need to be appropriate. Um, this is perhaps a speed limit you could envisage on the German Autobahn, but perhaps not on this track. So when we were looking at the various indicators, one after the other was falling out. And the way that we actually looked at the indicators is to employ uh, expert groups. That's what we do. We convene experts and get them to think for us. And this is why we're so pleased to have you guys here today. And there were two expert groups that were thinking this through. One was developing indicators for all six targets. But one group specifically looked at the target of well-being and advised WHO on how we should measure the well-being of the population, population, and how we could potentially arrive at the target. And that was not a trivial process. The group met three times. And I just want to give you a flavor of the deliberations that they had. The first step was to look at what others are doing. What are our partners doing? The OECD has been in this business for a long time. And uh, they look at, and here you see, the uh, 11 domains of well-being of the Better Life Index. And one of them is life satisfaction, a subjective well-being indicator. And they've done this uh, for several years, and um, they're doing an amazing job reporting this. Likewise, the European Union, through Eurostat, um, they're also looking at this through survey work, the EU SILC, that is the EU Statistics on Income and Living Conditions. And since 2013, they include indicators on quality of life, life satisfaction, affect, and life purpose. So they're far ahead of the curve, certainly ahead of us, in integrating this work. And we, we are the health organization and we had not done so to this point. So we asked these partners to come and join us in those expert meetings. And they said, okay, the first thing we need to do is to define what we mean by well-being. And I was very pleased that Sarah put up the slide on the ill-defined um, uh, well-being definition. I think that is important because that is what drove this group. They said, if you define it too tightly, then you will never really arrive at some policy decisions or they will always be considered inappropriate. So. In a loose way, they said that well-being exists in two dimensions, and you have heard this today from the other speakers, subjective and objective, and that it comprises an individual's experience of their life, that is a subjective element, as well as a comparison of life circumstances, objective, with social norms and values. And the latter then includes all these domains that you have just seen from OECD, education, health, etc. So this is something that is very broad, that recognizes the duality, but also the individual. And again, that for us, in a way, is a departure from what we have done before. We are the guys who measure population health. No, actually, we measure population morbidity and mortality. 
So we had to arrive at some targets uh, and indicators. The targets were prescribed uh, to some extent in the previous year, but then this group uh, supported us and arrived at 22 core indicators for all six targets. That means these are the indicators everyone should measure, and some additional targets that would be nice to have, sort of thing. Now, I'm not expecting you to read this slide, but what I would like to focus on is the fourth element, and that is the target to enhance well-being of the European population. And here you see a number of uh, indicators that were proposed. Life satisfaction is the one that was proposed for subjective well-being, and this is something that is regularly collected, not just only by the EU, as I've shown you, but also by Gallup, who do this through their world poll every year. And the member states agreed, yeah, that would be a really good subjective well-being indicator to have, although getting that through the regional committee was already a struggle, and a two-year struggle at that. But then they said we also need to really look at some objective well-being indicators. We heard from Mark how political well-being is, and yes, it is extremely political. And there is a lot that governments can do to enhance the well-being of their population. So we didn't want to let them get away without that. And it is important that it's recognized. And I always think of this incredibly good figure that Pekka Pushka used to show, where you have the Sisyphus, this person pushing up a rock on a slope. And of course, this person could help himself or herself by losing weight and shrinking the rock, or by stopping smoking, thus shrinking the rock and making the load easier. But the government can do an awful lot to help too by just reducing the slope. And this is something I think that in unison and in combination is absolutely needed. There has to be the individual, but there has to be also the state. So when we look at objective well-being indicators that were proposed, I first want to focus on the left-hand side of the table because that gives you the domains that the expert felt are key, that we cannot miss in any kind of indicator list for this policy. And that is, and that's interesting, social connections and relationships, economic security and income, of course, that will never go away, natural and built environment and education. But of course, that list is wholly inadequate. We cannot stop there. But we said we would like to at least propose this as a beginning. And so the indicators you see on the right-hand side, indicator already adopted, those were things that were already in the indicator list and that they felt would also help measuring these new domains. Gini coefficient, unemployment rate, and primary school age not enrolled. In other words, who are the children who are not enrolled in primary school? But they said that's not enough. We need more indicators, and those are in the column on the left-hand side, where you see that social support and uh, percentage population with improved sanitation facilities should definitely be measured as core indicators of objective well-being. And in addition, countries should endeavour to measure also the percentage of persons that are over 65 and are living alone, the total household consumption, and educational attainment, at least completed secondary education. Now, these are perhaps strange, but the advantage of these is that they are routinely available or available through surveys that we have direct access to. And that was extremely important to member states. They said to us, don't start new surveys. We can't collect more information. Use what we've got or what others have got. And that was really important in order to even get this through. But that, I think, is a good start. But we cannot possibly stop there. And this is why these discussions are so important. We see the development of well-being indicators for Health 2020 evolve over the coming years. For us, this is just a departure. The goal, uh, I don't dare articulate that, but I think we really are aiming at something that is so comprehensive, yet simple, that it will put pressure on governments um, to do something pretty objective about people's health. And the other thing that is interesting here is we're seeing actually a life course perspective. There are indicators that are really looking at older age, indicators that are looking more at childhood, and others um, for the whole population. So whenever we come up with indicators, we need to make sure that we really cover all these angles. And even then, I think this is still pretty deficient. As I said, this is the beginning. I mean, we're barely scratching the surface here, although it was difficult enough to get through that surface. What we need to do next is a lot more. And this is where the work that Niels is leading in our office with the support of the Wellcome Trust comes in. And that is looking at other determinants of health, and here in particular, the cultural determinants. 
well-being is very culturally determined. I mean, we heard this a little bit from the two, uh, two previous speakers that um, different cultures look at well-being and happiness differently. And we would really like to grapple and come to grips with that. What determines that? How is well-being influenced by that? So um, we have started a new project on the cultural determinants of health and an expert group that will meet next year to really hash that out. But there are other determinants, commercial, political, we've heard it. But I had a real aha moment this morning. Um, Claire Mattison is here from the Wellcome Trust, who's the Director of Strategy. She said, um, this is actually all a label. What we really need to think about is just determinants of health and well-being. And yeah, that's what we really need to do. We need to come away from these little silos and think, oh, culture, that's what the Ministry of Culture deals with, and health, that we do that, and transport, they do something else. If the whole of government approach of Health 2020 is working, we actually should only be talking about determinants of health and well-being. And if we come to that at the very end, then I will be a very happy woman going to retirement. But of course, we want member states to move this forward. Member states need to push this agenda. And the way they push this, hopefully, is through an initiative we started uh, 18 months ago. I will not go into detail, but it includes all of this work on determinants of health and well-being. We want member states to use evidence and information for policy making, but not only in the traditional sense. We're not talking just data. Data are only one part of evidence. There are many other things, and culture and health is something that we would like to add to that. But we want member states to be accountable and report to their citizens. I don't think it's enough that we report. We must, we should, we will. It's our constitutional mandate. But actually, I think it is really member states who need to be accountable to their constituents and their citizens. We report like this, and I will not go into it, but I will just say that the European Health Report, which comes out every three years, is one way for us to be the guardian of health and information in, in, in the region. And the next report, which will be launched next year at the Regional Committee, will actually have a special focus on cultural determinants of health and hopefully give a progress report of what has happened with well-being in the region in the last three years. I stop here because this is um, a very inspirational quote from Sir Michael Marmot on our initiative for health information. He said that whatever you do, you need good health information, and that includes well-being measures. Because to address inequalities, you must address the inequalities in health information. Where health and well-being is poorest, you have the poorest information. And that's not just in different countries. Each country has the poorest health information in the areas where people have the poorest health or the lowest levels of well-being. So we really need to improve this. We need to think really in a very innovative way about measurement of well-being. We cannot stop at just describing it. I think we need to hold politicians to account with measurements. That does not mean necessarily quantitative, but there are a lot of qualitative uh, indicators we'd like to report on. With that, I stop and thank the Chair very much for your patience. Sorry. Thank you, Claudia. And I'd like to invite Dr. Adjus Soros, the Director of the Division of Policy and Governance for Health and Wellbeing at the Euro WHO Regional Office for Europe. Please. Dear colleagues, <clears throat> the work we do is partly capturing what is new, what is promising, what could make a difference to people's lives. We want to believe that the policies we produce are truly 21st century policies. They are evidence-informed. They are embedded in the best values that modern uh, societies should base all what they do. And I think we do well in that. But the hard job is when you go to a country and countries in this vast and very diverse region are at very different starting points. 
and our task is to broker these ideas. Our task is to explain. It's not very difficult to be in, in, a, in a meeting like this and feel inspired and, and feel, oh, yay, that's something great to know about. But then you leave the room and you feel numb because you really don't know where to start. And the worst part, as I was saying to colleagues this morning, is that now, maybe because we've been successful in selling these ideas, now member states call our bluff and they say, you convinced us. We want to work on well-being. We want to work on equity. We want to work on the social determinants of health. Where do I start, Dr. Tsuros? And it's great that you capture this wonderful idea of well-being or equity and the right to health in one word that I, as minister <coughs> or president, can put it in the introduction of my new policy. But then we want to see how this translates into something concrete in the pages to follow. And the dilemma we are facing, or the challenge we are facing increasingly, is that the moment we started venturing outside the safe walls of the health sector, um, giving each other stand innovations on all these newly or all rediscovered concepts, with the work on social determinants of health, the work on a host of beautiful issues, promising issues, because well-being is part, as I see it, part of a continuum of issues that uh, relate to the same concept, people at the center, empowerment, engagement, social capital, resilience, they are all the same thing. It's how it's almost like having, you know, a big pot in the middle with all these ideas, and then you pull out whatever is the concept that could resonate better in the hearts of your target audience. Sometimes community resilience today it resonates much better because when you talk about um, economic austerity then you start asking the question, why is it that some communities react, adapt, respond better than other communities? What is that magic juice in their blood and genes that makes them react so well? Why being unemployed in Loughborough in England is, uh, is totally depressive, although you may have enough uh, um, social benefit, and why is it that you are sitting with much less in a cafe in Greece and you feel happy? <laughs> what is it that makes that difference? We can deconstruct and superanalyze all those things. We can have fantastic intellectual debates, which I personally enjoy tremendously. But in the end, it comes to a point when our decision makers want to know what they're supposed to do. The problem with a lot of this work is twofold. One is that a lot of what we're expecting them to do has to do with other sectors. You heard before, it's about education, it's about social support, it's about the environment, it's about a host of activities that relates to the policies of other sectors. And I think We've been great in convincing each other, but we have not yet been able to truly talk about a whole of society, whole of government approach. When the day will come when health and well-being will be performance indicators of whole of governments, in addition to their economic productivity, industrial output, and so on and so on. That we have not reached. Uh, we manage sometimes to reach some sectors like education, environment. There is tremendous experience in this office, but we still have to go a long way to do that. And the same applies to the upstream social determinants. So in a way, um, it is good that we have better understanding of these issues. 
And I think it is also good that um, we make the evidence-based case why it makes a difference. And I come to the second aspect. I said it's twofold. One is reaching out, engaging, convincing the other sectors. The other part is that for a long time, all these issues were regarded as soft. You know, we are in the Ebola era at the moment or period. You know, you are looking for a vaccine. And, and uh, very often talking to our colleagues in the Communicable Diseases Department, they have a very easy cause-effect relationship. You, you reach out, you vaccinate everybody, you have a result, you reduce uh, 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 morbidity and the incidence of, of the disease. But it doesn't happen with many of the issues we are dealing with here. So soft means, A, we have to be able to convincingly present that investing in people, investing in supportive environments, because you spoke before about individual and population. I mean, you have to realize that my reality, our reality often is, you go to a country and you talk to a minister, and you know where is the starting point? It's not 21st century public health approaches. It's we have to do a health education campaign to tell people what not to do. And you say, but Mr. Minister, this is a little bit outdated. We're talking about social marketing. We're talking about other approaches now to, to make people function in environments that support them to make healthy choices about those things. So what I'm saying is, it is there is a drive with all these great legitimate now concepts, but there is a reality here of an eager political, and I love that one of the speakers spoke about the political dimension. Our original director started her speech this year by saying that health is a political choice. And a lot of what we're talking about is basically political. Thank God that these ideological positions today are also uh, evidence-informed. So somehow it's not equity 30 years ago with very weak evidence. It's equity in the 21st century with plenty of evidence to support what we say. So uh, I would like to, uh, to, to end by saying that um, uh, I think it is great that we we make legitimate concepts that can make a difference in addition to invest it in the hard areas because an area of Health 2020 which, for which there is a, a, a crying need is to strengthen public health capacities. That's hardcore. But at the same time, investing in participative democracy in, in communities that have a voice and a say is also increasingly important. A lot to understand here. Why is it Denmark the most happy country in the world, but also with some suicide that compared to, uh, to other countries that are much more grumpy in telling whether they are sort of happy or not, and yet they, they're, they're sort of other indicators of joie de vivre are much higher. I don't know. But uh, sometimes I'm confused by our complex ideas of trying to define love, well-being, and happiness, but somehow things don't always make sense. But I think we are doing good. The key entry point in uh, Health 2020 um, is that it is, as uh, Claudia showed, well-being is there, as and one of the speakers before also used the word unifier conceptual unifier, it is true, reaching out to other sectors, when you say health and well-being, they make them click more easily because it resonates more easily with the broader political kind of goals uh, that a, a, a government may have as opposed to th them thinking that health is that guy's or woman's kind of responsibility, i.e. the Minister of Health. So I think we are good. The resilience entry point is tremendous opportunity because it captures a lot of those issues, health literacy, engagement, empowerment, social capital, 
and, and so on. Um, but uh, lastly, I want to say that, uh, you know, uh, I think we, we, we managed now to, to make these uh, uh, goals legitimate, but we have to be able to listen carefully to where countries come from uh, and not to close up if they don't immediately become ecstatic with the presentation of these concepts. We have to find ways. Uh, there are countries in this uh, region, many countries, who are still allergic, not to listen to the term well-being, but equity. There are many countries where I go and I have to go all around, around, around to find a way to talk about equity without mentioning the bad word. Because, so that's the issue. We have to navigate, to present, to connect, and to broker these issues, because I think this is an area that has a great promise for the future. Thank you. Well, thank you for four wonderful presentations. I'm, I'm going to throw the floor up for discussion and questions, but I'd like to start with a couple of questions myself. Uh, I mean, as a historian of the WHO, it has always struck me that the primary health care message and the traditional message, uh, tra traditional medicine uh, department of the WHO has actually also been interested in notions uh, of well-being, which are very different from the scientifically defined uh, uh, the notions of health and disease. So uh, you have, I think, natural allies within the organization. It's just that they need empowerment, I think. Uh, so, so then coming back to the issue of power, uh, definitions are often a display of power. Culture is power. Person who defines culture is powerful. He or she can tell us about complexity and that is very important. But he and she can also generalize and that is where I become nervous. Mm -hmm. um, because Europe in the last 20 years, I think most of us will agree, has transformed due to migration. Uh, Europe is part of an interconnected world, part of the globe through migration. There are huge migrant populations where unemployment is higher usually than the national norm. So when we generalize on a national scale, how do we then bring those imbalances forward through our definitions because if there is one great strength of the social determinants report which both of you mentioned uh, it's that it tells us that the richest countries in this world have inequalities that you can have wonderful chelsea and then you can have liverpool where malnutrition in some parts of liverpool are as bad as or glasgow or life expect expectancy is as low as some of the worst parts of india and you can have parts of India where you have a very high life expectancy. So, so how does the social determinants model really help you as you search for a definition of the cultural determinants of health? And if one has to be critical, there is a big weakness in the social determinants report, which I think many people are too polite to talk about. It, it, it tries to measure by defining nationality. Nations are very important. But then it misses out an enormous problem. What about the stateless? What about trafficked women? Some of the most vulnerable people in Europe get left out from the viewpoint of a very influential report. So how do you then make sure that some of the most vulnerable don't get left out as you develop your definition? You may ask them. Both of you. <laughs> Brilliant question. And can I answer by making a very, very blasphemous, preposterous statement? I do not think the definition is the right place to do that. I actually think that it will never be sufficient. It will never really go into the level of detail and depth you require, but I think the indicators can. And although they are difficult to, to deconnect from a definition, I actually think we need to start with the description 
through indicators. There may be new indicators, there may be existing indicators, and these are the ones I think you then need to break down. And you need to really, and this is something that Health 2020 indicators at the moment do for, for the ones that exist, is to say that governments, we're not interested in your one national number. We're not even interested in your one national number by age and sex. We're interested in numbers that come from a sub-national, perhaps municipality level, so that we really have locally broken down information that capture vulnerable groups. I don't know whether I'm using the term right, but all groups of society. And um, we are currently working with headquarters on training to measure inequalities. And there are tools that will help countries, and we've just taught that in a, in a course two weeks ago, uh, the, the Autumn School of Health Information, these tools help you to get to those figures and to get to this information. And I don't think that any definition will help us here because that's where governments will stop and we don't want them to. That is not to say we will not attempt a definition, but that is also one explanation as to why the well-being definition is so suitably vague. Because what that means is, okay, we don't know what that means, now let's go and look at the indicator, what they actually want us to do. And I do think that is that opens up that catalogue. Not ideally, but it's a start. And we have for the last years and over a decade actually asked people to provide information at that level. Now, that is also not enough. Um, gender inequalities are not measured by uh, a sex breakdown. <laughs> Other inequalities are not measured by, you know, breaking down by education level or by GDP. Much, much more needs to be done on that. And I think eventually, I think my ideal world, and I know I'm really now saying something preposterous, is move away from definitions. I'm a quantitative person. Why am I saying something so crazy? But I actually think that. But see, I probably get some very violent reactions now. Oh. Yes? This morning, I had, we had a meeting to discuss uh, the new national policy development in, in Kazakhstan. And the colleagues from Kazakhstan uh, raised a point, which is very often the case. Uh, we talk about definitions now and the way we understand here certain concepts, but they alerted us to the fact that traditional translators are uh, choosing uh, uh, terms to translate concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were talking about health literacy or uh, other aspects in a, in a very, in, in way, in a very medical way. And uh, I don't speak Russian, but I have realized that how, how some of these great concepts that mean something in, 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 in our languages uh, spoken and not always. I don't know how to translate many of these terms in, in, in my native language, which is Greek. I don't know. Uh, I always look for something. But I was really uh, terrified that some terms which I thought were really uh, clearly understood in, in Russian are actually conveying a very different and much more narrow. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying that this is a point that we often disregard because we say, well, I'm not a translator, they do it. <laughs> but when you are in the business of uh, brokering uh, new ideas, we really have to pay attention to how they are understood. And when it comes to definitions, I don't quite share your view that the European Social Determinants Review does not look uh, at all people uh, I I because it is uh, reflecting also the reality of the uh, new social landscape of Europe, which is totally multi-ethnic and where we got away also from the concept of vulnerable groups to vulnerability. Because today, in today's economic realities, we are all potentially vulnerable groups. We are all, uh, we can all fall below the poverty line or find ourselves, uh, like in Greece, uh, thousands and th hundreds of thousands of people who had secure uh, access to health services now are uncovered. Uh, so you can never say, you know, this is a group that we target. Um, but I think uh, uh, we have opened the door to understanding that health is actually and truly uh, the result uh, of the actions of many sectors, 
uh, and it is probably the most sensitive kind of uh, indicator that we are doing well in many aspects of our economic, social development activities. So it's not only a target, let's get more health and well-being, but also it's a good indicator overall to give us an idea that things are not going well. So I think there is more acceptance than ever. That's mm -hmm. my uh, feeling. There is a long way to go to see all these things implemented. But now, uh, even the most uh, conservative uh, clients we have out there, they seem open to embrace these ideas and see that just within the health sector, health will never be delivered to its full potential. I wanted to say something. I mean, I think I, I think Claudia's point about indicators rather than concepts <coughs> or language is really important. What Agis has just said, I think, is important. I think the risk with language, and it comes back to Sanjoy's point about power, is that terms like well-being, like stress, can be appropriated by particular groups for their own interests. That that kind of language can become powerful in certain ways, not just in the ways in which it means something different. But you know, if you give an example from the stress literature, stress in the late in the 1960s, 1970s, as I was saying earlier, is, is was sort of focused towards stressful life events amongst the lower social classes, the deprived. But it became commandeered by certain political groups and certain industries, so that it became executive stress <laughs> that people were worried about. It was middle class, upper class stress that people were worried about. So it was taken because of those other agencies that you're dealing with. Yeah. They were extracting what they wanted and completely steering the debate about health and well-being towards their own interests. So there is a, there is a tension in a way, and I think, I, I think you're right, that what we, while we have to adopt a language and a concept, what we are really trying to get at is experience mm -hmm. beneath that at the local level. Yeah. Um, and that is sort of what Sanjoy is talking about as well, is that, is that not imposing a language and a concept, but understanding experience, however poor our language is yeah. to portray that. But we, I, I think we have to fight, I think we have to resist the appropriation of language by certain interest groups as well. Absolutely. Madam. Um, my name is Maria Greenblatt, I'm head of translation here. And I'm <laughs> I am a Russian speaker, and I'm a historian by training also. So I would like to point, uh, um, in my opinion, to a very important issue. We don't translate words, we describe concepts. And uh, always when we translate something that doesn't exist in the particular culture, we have a problem with translation. I always uh, give one example. Uh, the word challenge in English is positive. It's actually something you overcome to achieve something. In Russian, it doesn't exist. Whatever challenge is, it will always be negative. It is just because the culture is different. So the problem is that because we are inventing the language in English, or it exists in English already, and then we give it to translators. And translators definitely try to navigate between all these uh, difficult terms, uh, and they try to translate them. And in many cases, it is a translation of the word, or it's just the attempt of a translator to, to describe a concept. But if the concept doesn't exist in the language, you cannot, in, you cannot translate. So this is something that I think people, especially in our region, where Russian is a second lingua franca, uh, maybe even a bigger lingua franca than English, uh, have to work together to try not to translate terms, but to put the concepts to, uh, closer to each other. And then maybe we can put on top of it something how to call it. I'm not responding because um, Masha's uh, unit is in my division, but um, to say that this is really true for all our languages that we have in the office. Um, some languages like German don't have a word for well-being. We don't have a word for public health. 
So if you go to that level, you're almost at the point of saying, oh my goodness, do we have to start all over again in all of them? But what that means is that the language debate is key to the cultural determinants of health debate. And this is why I want to thank Masha for this excellent comment. But uh, to, to about this appropriation, uh, uh, health literacy to me, and we have a publication that I would like to recommend that you, you it's, it's a fantastic concept. But a colleague of mine alerted me recently, he said, I guess be very careful because the term uh, health literacy now has been appropriated by the, the pharmaceutical industry mm -hmm. uh, who are using it now in connection with uh, people's knowledge about uh, uh, the the uh, side effects and other, the use of medicines and so on, and, and it's taking a totally different one. But the same term, I was fascinated to learn in Russian, is called sanitary uh, uh, literacy. So you think that this publication is about washing hands? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah and it's such a shame uh, that it doesn't convey what it is. But there you are. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Tim Nguyen, a unit leader, evidence and information for policy. Uh, I guess, you know, you, you highlighted the point that, uh, uh, or brought us back to reality that, you know, once we leave this room, you know, how, how do we make it happen with member states, you know? That's a, a key challenge and you alerted to the point that, you know, health is a choice and, you know, uh, they need, the, the government itself needs to make a choice and, you know, approaches from whole of government, whole of society. Uh, but I wanted to ask our historians, you know, about best practices. You know, where do you see in which countries, you know, these kinds of concepts work? You know, we always hear about Bhutan, you know, that they say uh, uh, GDP, that's not their uh, goal, but it's the happiness of the nation. But can you actually tell us, you know, if these concepts work there or other countries where they have, you know, taken such a pros and what they did there to make it happen? <clears throat> the well-being movement, I think, at a, at a governmental level, seems to be exactly that argument that you know it's not only about GDP; it's about something, something else. And uh, just on the moment of, of the appropriation, one, one has to be a little bit careful, I think, probably about whether that is um, is, is a good thing or whether it's being used as an excuse to sidestep various issues. But um, a number of countries have, st have started going down that path. Uh, France commissioned the big report that Stiglitz. Joseph Stiglitz led on, um, which is a really interesting read. It's, it's a, a good read. Britain has um, has gone has gone there as well. In the United Kingdom. We've had a, a national consultation um, to see what people thought were important in their lives. The usual things turned up. Uh, they've come up with I think ten or eleven indicators. But in the, in the annual population survey now, there are four questions sort of evaluative ones, which are, I think is something like, it's the kind of, on the whole, how do you think your life's going sort of question, the satisfaction. Um, there's a couple of thing, questions of the kind of yesterday, how anxious were you yesterday, how happy were you? Um, and there's another one, I can't remember what the other one is. And they're, they're, they have annual surveys now that collect this information. So it's early days, I think there's been about three of them. Um, the, re the reports come out saying it's gone up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> to their credit, they've, they've tried to locate that to, to sort of what's going on in the national economy, not just what's going on locally. There's some breakdown into regions, but I, you know, I think the important thing, as has already been said, is, is how that's broken down further, probably. What, it's not so much the measuring as what you do with it afterwards, I think, that's, that's, that's where it's at. So there are some, there are movements that way. I hear rumours that Bhutan's not quite so keen on its happiness indi indicator anymore, but... Um, oh, really? yeah. that, I have nothing to substantiate that, but that's <laughs> someone who I think knows about these things saying that. <laughs> Can I, uh, I I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm critical of those who use terms and then you don't find evidence in their, in their policies of true action. But for some of these terms, the new emerging important terms, I think it tells something about the government already if they include it. If I read the policy which reads um, a policy for health and well-being or for health and equity, I, I will be very critical if I don't see real evidence of, uh, of real actions, but it gives a message politically that they have an a broader mind about the, the issue. I mean, I welcome now that increasingly our member states are using the right words 
Uh, but of course, increasingly, we are also anxious that they don't pay lip service to all that. But it says something that there is a willingness now to embrace this idea of health as a whole of government responsibility and, uh, and so on. And one group, because you spoke about local level, that has taken this on, even without us being necessarily the advocates, is urban planners. I was in our conference of healthy cities last week, and uh, we had three uh, top urban planners and architects who spoke about designing cities for health and well-being, or designing cities for happiness. And they spoke about concrete ways to make the, <coughs> the built environment experience as an experience that can be conducive to, to, to happiness and to feeling good. And so, you know, there are concrete examples to quote also. It's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult question, a challenging question for historian, because I was, as I was uh, thinking about the matrix that I presented, I was thinking about whether I would suggest there's an ideal position to be in that matrix. Mm -hmm. Is there, I mean, best practice is problematic, I think, and as I was thinking about it, I mean, for me, politically, there probably is an ideal position, and that's at the center, where the various tensions between individual and population, between circumstances and constitution, are taken fully into account in a particular location. But I think for me it comes down to the fact that, that, the, that the drive behind understanding the social and cultural determinants is a local and specific one. And best practice in terms of measurement and management in one person's life or another or one nation's life or another will not necessarily translate and that's one of the challenges of providing an overarching framework and a process and a strategy that then has to be embedded in a set of local practices in which the cultural expectations, the social conditions, and as Agis was saying, the point at which they're starting the process are all very different. So I suppose you know, that, that makes the case to me for the importance of understanding the social and the cultural mm -hmm. as part of the process of implementing policies to improve health and well-being. Can I just, just to, to add to what Mark said, I think it is really important that you have this complementary understanding from various parts of well-being and beyond well-being. Um, what I would be very nervous about is a government that says, God, we have great happiness indices. And look just at the five Scandinavian countries. Denmark, top, 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 quite a distance to the next one down. And yet, in terms of life expectancy, mortality, suicide rates, prescription rates for antidepressants, Denmark is by far the worst, actually, in the lower third of the EU. So the last thing I would want is the government to say, we don't need to do that because you know, we don't need a suicide prevention strategy. We've got really happy people. And um, I, I'm always worried when a government hones in on that and then forgets all the other indicators which need to be seen as a tapestry and I think this is why it's so important to have well-being and health and all these different elements of well-being together, but in the context of the rest of it. And this is, I think, what Health 2020 is trying to do. So let's not let them get away with it, but at the same time also use this as an additional angle. So it's not a replacement therapy, so to speak.
Yeah, we have uh, we have a couple of questions um, from the web, um, and maybe I'll just read them out, and we we can see if uh, if anybody wants to respond to any of them. And um, so the first question is about uh, um, social media. Actually, what research is currently being undertaken um, on possible contribution of social media to well-being and happiness? So if uh, if there are any thoughts about social media and uh, well-being and happiness. Um, we have another question about just uh, uh, if the panel has any thoughts about well-being and aging. Um, and finally, we have a question from Twitter, but I think it's actually from the room um, for Mark Jackson specifically, but probably for anybody who, who wants to uh, um, wants to talk about it. Sarah mentioned this as well. Um, when does individual responsibility for health become blame for individual ill health? So those are our three questions. Uh, um, over to the panel. Thanks, great questions. Um, I don't know much about the, the social media and well-being. There's a, there's a, there are some studies that suggest some, some aspects of Facebook have, have negative impacts on well-being because of the visual element, because people don't put up photos of um, bad things happening. They don't say they've just had you know, a huge row with their family. They tend to put up all the positive things. Um, and there's a danger. <coughs> some people are susceptible to the suggestion that everyone else is having a much better life than they are, and there's a concern, I think, in the context that I read this, was the concern that some other social media can extract exactly the element that's the most impactful on Facebook on this particular trend, which is the visual element. So in Instagram, where it's all visual and so forth, so there's some concerns that that rolls on. Because everybody knows that people are photoshopping their photos, but they somehow, you know, you, you don't somehow take that on board when taking its impact on you. So there's there's been some studies that have shown, you know, some tendencies for people to feel a little depressed, particularly around the holiday season, it seems. Yeah, Everybody yeah. else is having a much better holiday than you are. Um, which is interesting. And, you know, there's other, in, other benefits, of course. Ageing, I think, is a really interesting topic. I was at a, um, an Arts Council meeting around ageing. I think we haven't really got our heads around what we do about um, trying to assess the impact of any intervention where you've got quite serious uh, mm -hmm. dementia involved. So somebody can, involve, can be engaged in an in intervention. They may not particularly recall much about it the next day, um, you're not necessarily expecting to make someone kind of better. Mm. Um, you may be hoping that you hold things a little steadier or slow down deterioration, but how on earth you measure that, how you measure something not happening, yeah. um, involves another range of, of techniques that, that probably need to be thought about. So I, I think there's some very interesting questions about certain aspects of well-being with ageing. The third one was, uh, was Mark. Blame and responsibility. Yeah, you know. I, I, I'm not entirely sure what the answer is, and it depends what the question is. If it means when does individual responsibility become blame in terms of chronology, always and never, in a sense, I think is the uh, is the answer. I don't see. I, and back to the matrix and the and and blame and responsibility. These are not polar opposites. Mm -hmm. I think they're relational and coexistent all the time. And the, the, the relationship between them, I think, is often a sort of reversible equilibrium. Uh, and it's never one or the other, and it's never ever one, but at certain moments in time, for political and economic reasons, responsibility, which can be empowering, turns into blame, which can be disempowering. And, and the issue is to try, and I think for historians and, and other social scientists, is to identify the ways in which those are contingent upon economic, social, political, cultural factors. So I don't think there's ever a point at which blame slips easily or converts the turn of a switch into responsibility and vice versa. But I think these are always in dialogue. These are always in tension. And the, the point on the scale between one and the other that we are at in any moment of time in any place will be dependent upon a wide set of social and cultural factors. Now, that's a complete non-answer to the question at one point, but I think historically one can see that shifting through time and through space according to circumstances. And the, and the key to understanding, you know, I don't, again, that comes down to, to a political position about where you place the state in terms of responsibility and how you blame the state as well. So as well as there being a relationship between a tension between blame and responsibility, there's also a tension between the individual and the state, historically as well, which, which will shift the point at which responsibility might be seen more as in, in, in terms of blame. So it's, 
I think it's fluid and complex, and I think, I think that, again, is perhaps something that humanities scholars and social scientists can help to unpick, is those relations and dynamics. Can I just add something to that? Add just and then, sorry. No, no. I mean, I think there's another tension around where health is seen to be produced in that, in that continuum. So I mean, we have got is a tendency for health to be seen to be produced at the level of the individual and re resources for interventions heading that way. So I'm, I'm nothing against cognitive behavioural therapy, but it's, you know, resources are limited. If you're going to say, um, as the county I live in is thinking about doing mindfulness training for all the teachers, uh, you know, that's a, a lot of resource that's going in, into that particular form of intervention that isn't then going somewhere else. So it's a question of on that continuum where the resource weighting is going as well. So it has fairly important uh, effects. I, I love the, the, this uh, idea that was put by Mark. I don't think it was a non-answer. It, it was a very clever and, and good answer because uh, that's the reality. Uh, and w what we often, we are often faced uh, with is to be able to, to convince policymakers that they're working on both ends of that uh, continuum. I mean, if you, if you l think of lifestyles, which is a trendy way, that's where individual responsibility comes very much into the fore, the health promotion slogan, healthy choices, easy choices, you have the choice, you are still responsible, but someone makes the choices easier, which is the policy environment. That's really what makes, or in health literacy now, kind of uh, uh, terminology, you have a health literate individual, but you're also talking about health literate organizations. So it's always the dialogue and the interaction but you cannot just blame the victim as we were doing in the 70s and expect that things will, will happen, uh, ignoring all the social determinants around. When it comes to healthy aging, I think if you want to find the perfect example of applying the concept of well-being in terms of discrimination, in terms of empowerment and engagement, in, ter in terms of uh, listening, in terms of a life course approach. The well-being and healthy aging is probably one of the best ways to describe what it means to its full of this concept. Uh, totally. Oh, yeah. I'm just thinking about the life course. I think the studies of well-being in the life course show that it dips in the middle somewhere. It's it's you know when yeah, you're working and you maybe you have a family. You know, it's in that kind of not early career, middle to late career, then it, you know, actually, mm. I, it probably relates to what expectations one has at various points in life. Uh, no, uh, just a comment about uh. that deep in the middle of, of the life, but it's also very different across Europe. In, in West European countries, you have this deep at 45, 55, Case of age, but it looks different in the eastern part of the region. It goes down and, and down. And so, uh, what are the policy implications, or have the policy implications? There is, is the questions we should ask ourselves. It's a really interesting question because I was I, I my current research is on health in middle age and the sort of focusing around the midlife crisis, and and that occurs, supposedly, not in some cultures, actually, which means that their understanding of aging, their experience of aging is very different. Um, but it also occurs at, at, at different ages in different ways. But it's one of the things that, that uh, has, has often struck me about the history of medicine in particular um, and the way we write it, and perhaps about some of the clinical research uh, and the social science research is that, and it came up from something Claudia said earlier, that that we focus on the young as having certain problems and the elderly, but we assume quite often that between 16 and 18 and 60, we're all much on a plateau and nothing much changes. Whereas if one looks very close at all the health indices, the happiness indices, the well-being indices, there are dramatic changes, culturally specific, I think you're absolutely right, and 
perhaps gendered in certain ways yeah. and class related in certain ways. And, and, and those kind of complexities and those differences are, are poorly understood, I think, in terms of health in middle age mm. as well as mm. health in children and the elderly as well. So it's a very good question, that. Having said that, there are some studies, of course, you'll have seen them, that suggest that this is biological rather than social, that gorillas oh. have a midlife crisis and go through this U-shaped happiness and they've done some observational work that is deeply flawed evidentially, yeah. I think. <laughs> but it sort of plays on that stereotype that we have, that we have to unpick, unpick in, a, in a slightly more careful and nuanced way, I think, in cultural terms. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. So I, th I think we should continue. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Neil is giving me on my toes. Thumbs up. Um, well, I'd like to thank all the speakers. It's been absolutely wonderful um, um, to be here, hear all of you present and learn from it. The yeah, I'd like to thank the Welcome Trust, without whose support a lot of this would be impossible. So thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> I know how busy colleagues in UN City and the WHO Regional Office are, so thank you for being here as well. Uh, it's appreciated. And in particular, I'd like to thank Claudia and Natasha, the Division of Information, Evidence, Research and Innovation for all their support. But adapting my brief to local knowledge, I'd like to thank Niels as well. Yay. So thank you, Niels. Yeah. Thank you. See you again. Yeah. Yeah.